What were the most common type of wounds to result in death during William Shakespeare's time, using swords like this basket-hilted broadsword or this rapier? Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria in East Lanting Arms and these are original antiques but what I like to do is study the original antique first-hand accounts of combat and sword use and all of the things around arms and armour. So what we're going to look at in this video are some first-hand primary source accounts from British historical records of fights with swords. Some of them are duels, some of them are arguments, some of them are murders, but what we're going to look at is these types of swords that were used in the Tudor Elizabethan eras and into the 17th century all the way up to the English Civil War. These types of swords, either cut and thrust swords or uh, specialised thrusting swords like this rapier, what were the most common locations or rather wounds that were given with them that resulted in death? Now this isn't going to be an exhaustive look at all of the sources available or anything like that. I am simply going to pull out a bunch of first-hand accounts more or less randomly and have a look at where they say, when they do say, where they say the fatal wound was given and see if that tells us anything interesting about swordsmanship in this period. And another place you can observe the deadly effects of weapons like these is in the awesome game and sponsor for this video, who's Raid Shadow Legends. You know, I've been playing Raid for years now and I'm thinking, you know, what are the main reasons that I keep coming back to this game? I pull it out of my pocket when I'm on the train or when I'm waiting for someone to arrive, I have a quick game. Why is it so engaging? So I've decided five main reasons why I really love Raid. First reason is it's tactical. It's got a whole bunch of different ways to play the game. All of those require you to be tactical about how you arrange your team. Second reason is the graphics. Both the environments look awesome and the individual characters look absolutely awesome as well. The third reason is characters. The characters are so rich in design. They're from specific cultures, the little details of their armour and weapons and their beards are just so beautifully done. Fourth reason is that they constantly have events going on and they're constantly changing, there's constantly new uh, things being organised to keep you engaged in the game. And the fifth reason is rewards. If you play regularly, even if you just log on and play for five minutes each day, you get rewards. Now unless you've been living under a rock, you will know that Ronda Rousey, MMA superstar, is now in Raid. And since I got her on my team, she's been absolutely kicking ass. You can add Ronda to your team simply by opening Raid for seven days up until the 20th of February, and you'll get her for free. You can also check the promotions for new and old players down in the link below. And if you are new to the game and you haven't played before, then by clicking that link down in the description or scanning the QR code on my screen right now, you can get bonuses worth up to $35. We're talking about a free epic level champion, Jotun, 100k silver, 50 gems and 2 epic skill tones. And once you're in, you'll get all of these bonuses up here in the inbox. And remember, this is only for new players and only for the next 30 days. Check it out right now and hopefully I'll see you in-game. I'm Captain Context. So now let's get back to the main content of this video and thanks once again to Raid for sponsoring this video. So, in these accounts, there are numerous types of weapons described, not just swords, other weapons as well, very often daggers. If I just put this one down for a second, so very often in this period it was quite common to either use a sword by itself or use a sword with a left hand dagger in the other hand or sometimes a sword with a buckler, these are often mentioned, or of course various types of polearm. And the two principal types of swords that were usually used in this period, so we're talking about middle of the 16th to middle of the 17th century, were rapiers or as we've seen here, the basket-hilted uh, cut-and-thrust backsword or broadsword, backsword, single-edged, broadsword, double-edged, or short swords of various types uh, that we commonly called hangers or cutlasses, um, and occasionally other certain types of swords. There would have been certain types of side sword, which is a sort of predecessor to the, to the rapier in some way, which has a cut and thrust blade like the broadsword, but uh, a hilt a little bit more like a rapier. And certain other types of swords may have been used, but the principle in Britain at least, and these are British or rather English sources, from the time of uh, you know Elizabeth I right the way through to King Charles I, the principal swords used by most people at this time were either basket-hilted um, cut-and-thrust swords or more specialised thrusting swords, so narrower, a little bit more nimble with the point rapier. And before I dive into these sources, I want to set one very clear parameter here. These are English sources and these are 
um, from official records, most of them from session rolls. So they're describing deaths. And that inevitably, the fact that they are an official record and the fact that they record deaths introduces bias. So anybody who's studied history academically will know that we deal with bias all the time and you have to acknowledge that there's bias in all sources and there's bias in these as well. For the purposes of this video, the most important thing to recognise is these are records of death. They are not, rec they are not records of injuries given or people who didn't die. Um, so these are court cases where somebody died essentially. So these are fatalities. It doesn't tell us about all the duels and fights and scraps that people had where someone didn't die. And the other thing I have to mention is that there is a bias in my own selection of these sources in that these are sources that came out in the search. Um, they weren't uh, picked for specific keywords or anything like that, other than the fact that they were mentioning encounters and deaths caused by swords and other weapons. Uh, but these specifically look at uh, wounds that were given to a named location. The vast majority of the sources that I have seen that talk about these kind of a phrase or duels, they don't say exactly where the fatal wound was given. So I, in this uh, video, I'm only going to be looking at sources which cite where the fatal wound was given. So without being too obscure, let's start with a bit of the conclusion. It is very clear when you look at the historical sources, we're going to see some examples here, that the vast majority of fatal wounds given by swords in the uh, second half of the 1500s and the first half of the 1600s in England were uh, either to the torso, usually the upper torso, the chest area, or the head. Okay, now that shouldn't be a huge surprise, even if we look at fatalities in modern warfare caused by bullets and shrapnel, if we look at uh, fatalities in knife crime, for example, the vast majority of people who die from uh, some type of trauma uh, caused by a weapon, it is usually to the chest cavity, so the rib cage, or to some part of the head, and sometimes the neck is implied as well in some of these descriptions of, uh, of head, uh, because sometimes they don't specifically say which part of the head, and I think sometimes they group the neck in. So, without a shadow of doubt, in the historical sources that I have pulled out and looked at and studied, the vast majority of fatalities are either to the head or to the chest. Let's have a look at some of those examples. So this is from the Middlesex Session Rolls of 1569, which is one of the earlier sources we're going to be looking at here. And it says, and having a sword and buckler, they went to the said place, and there within the great gate of, uh, of the Queen's aforesaid hospice went to the place called the Porter's Lodge, and waited for more than an hour the coming of the said Anthony with the intention of in at attacking him. And this was a, um, essentially they had laid a trap. Um, from the deci decipherable portions of the remnant of the decayed record, it appears that after lying in wait for and following him, George Varnham forced an affray on Anthony Martin at a place somewhere near the bridge towards Scotland Gate, and within the verge of the court, and was on the point of striking him with the intention of killing him, when in self-defence and for the preservation of his life, Anthony Martin crossed swords with his assailant. This is all legal jargon, of course, because it's important to assert whether the person is guilty or innocent. Uh, and in the ensuing encounter gave George Varnham a wound in the left part of his breast of which he died on the following day. And the verdict was that it was self-defence. So left part of the, the breast, so we can somewhere around the, the heart, certainly the upper chest. Um, and he died the next day. This is interesting. So although it was a fatal chest wound, he didn't die until the following day. You've got to bear in mind the medicine of the day. And what you might survive from today, you certainly might not survive from in 1569 because there were certain types of wound they just didn't really know how to treat back then. Ironically, you could probably have your arm chopped off and that could be cauterized if they got to you quick enough and you didn't die of blood loss, um, then that could be treated. But a relatively, by modern standards, minor stab wound in the torso, they might not be able to treat. You might die of internal bleeding, organ damage or, or something else. Now this is another one from 1587. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but it says they met in a certain field within the said parish called Fords Close, and that after parleying to get speaking together, they then and there drew forth their swords and daggers. So they both got a sword and dagger this time. 
and made an affray with one another, in which affray the aforesaid Josias Rainscroft, with his sword, gave the said John uh, Bitefield, Bitfield, on the forepart of his body a mortal blow. So there are many accounts like this which aren't very specific, but the forepart of his body. Which part of that? I mean, theoretically, it could be anywhere from his toe to his head. But my interpretation is that it's most likely the four parts of his body, given that they haven't said head specifically or leg or anything like that, it probably means the front of his torso. Was this a cut? Was this a thrust? I think most cuts to the front of the torso aren't going to be fatal, so most likely a thrust in the middle of the body. Right, this one again, middle succession rolls, 1588 this time. Um, uh, on the said day, blah, 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 I'll fast forward for you. Um, Gregory Porter, by giving him with a sword a wound under the left side of the breast, of which wound the same Gregory died instantly. Um, so the left side of his breast, under the breast it says, uh, yeah, under the left side of the breast. Hmm, that's an interesting one. So, this could mean one of two things. It could either mean uh, into the ribs or under the ribs on this side, in which case it could have hit the heart. It says he died instantly. The other option, left side of the breast, it could mean under here in the armpit. And we know that was a target certainly shown in uh, rapier treatises of the time. Uh, so if the blade went in here or if it went in here, here, somewhere around these parts, there's a good chance it traveling into the torso that could hit the heart. And it's an interesting detail that he died instantly because that would suggest a heart wound because there aren't many types of sword wound that will kill you instantly. So again, yet again, almost certainly a thrust almost certainly a uh, heart in this case, but overall the upper chest is a very, very common target, especially for thrust. So here we've got the middle succession rolls from uh, 1579 this time, and it says that the same Richard Lenwood drawing his sword advanced on Henry Farmer, who drew out his sword quickly, and that forthwith the two with their swords between the aforesaid hours fought with one another in the common way. It's an interesting term, in the common way. Um, and in the affray, Henry Farmer, with his sword, gave Robert Lenwood on the left side of his breast a mortal blow, of which the said Robert then and there died instantly. Um, so, it died instantly. I mean, if he died instantly, are we to assume that's heart? Um, but sometimes people just drop down from a, from a general chest cavity wound. But nevertheless, again, we've got a wound to the uh, chest. And I think the assumption has to be this is a thrust because most cuts to the chest wouldn't have that sort of immediate effect on an opponent. And they wouldn't normally, a cut to the chest wouldn't normally kill a person. Um, so I think probably a thrust into the chest cavity. And yet again, all of these accounts, it comes up again and again and again. The chest seems to be the primary target and the thrust is implied. Here's one from 1584, middle succession rolls again. So uh, again, I'll cut forward into it. Uh, when John Medley of the same city, Tallow Chandler, came upon the said James Gully with malice after thought, and with a sword murdered the same James Gully by giving him on the right side of his breast a mortal wound of which he died then and there instantly. So difficult to tell whether this was a fight or just a murder, but again we've got a chest wound, almost certainly a thrust. Um, finished the person uh, and they died instantly. Obviously in modern medical terms we might not say they died instantly but according to this account he went immediately out of action and uh, appeared to die um, instantly. In this one again I'll fast forward through the whole account um, but it describes two people having a, an affray, having a fight um, and they were together in Pat's Close near Mile End in the aforesaid parish, when after parleying with one another, they drew forth their swords and daggers. So again, they've both got swords and daggers, which were very popular carrying at this time. They may have been rapiers, we just don't know. They just say swords and daggers. And made, uh, and made an affray with one another, in which affray Richard Moore with his sword gave William Hudson on the fore part of his head a mortal wound, of which he there and then instantly died. Um, now, it's difficult to guess. If this was a thrust, it, it must have penetrated the brain. If it was a cut, again, it must have either knock, knocked him out, um, unconscious, of which he then perhaps died of blood loss, or chopped into the brain. But whether it's a cut or a thrust, and what kind of sword it is, we don't know. That might give us a clue. The fact is that he was wounded on the forepart of his head, 
instant death, so there must have been some type of brain damage involved here. And heads are a very common target. A lot of people don't think about heads as a thrusting target, they maybe think more of the torso. But if we look at the rapier and general fencing treatises of the time, the head is obviously the prime target for cuts most of the time, but it's also a very popular, particularly the face, and they might be referring to the face rather than the, than the upper part of the head here. Very popular target for thrusts. And here's another one from 1580, same source. Uh, at, at a certain field called um, Hemmings Close near the windmill at, I can't even say that word, with the intention of fighting together, John Sherwell having in his right hand a sword and in his left hand a buckler, and John Lawrence having in both his hands a piked staff. Piked means spiked, essentially pointed called a Dansk Javelin. That's very interesting, and again, a rabbit hole that maybe warrants further research. Dansk means Danish, I think. Um, and that between the said hours, they fought together and made an affray, in which the said John Lawrence, with his javelin, gave John Sherwell on the head a mortal wound. Now, here's another cool one from the Middlesex Session Rolls, this one, 1587. Uh, this is on January the 29th. Coroner's Inquisition post-mortem taken at the parish of St. Giles in the fields on view of the body of Humphrey Birchill, then and there lying dead, with verdict that on the 7th of January, uh, between the hours of 8 and 9 a.m. in the morning, the said Humphrey Birchill <clears throat> in the parish of St. Dustin's in the west encountered Richard Sutton, and that the two walked together holding speech with one another um, to a certain close in the same parish when uh, where Richard Sutton threw his cloak, sword and buckler on the ground and spoke words to which Humphrey Birchall replied by saying, but I will fight with thee. Thereupon an affray was made between the two, Richard Sutton fighting with sword and buckler while Humphrey Birchall fought with sword and dagger. Now, just a, a little break for a second there. That's very interesting because this is the period, this is 1587, this is exactly the period when it became popular in England to start using sword and dagger or rapier and dagger. And formerly, it would always be most fashionable and most normal to use sword and buckler. So this is the period when lots of people were using sword and buckler, lots of people were using sword and dagger, and hence we find these two opposed to each other. In which affray the said Richard Sutton with his sword gave the said Humphrey on the fore part of his neck a mortal blow of which he died, and the Richard Hutton thus slew Humphrey Birchill. So fore part of the neck, I'm guessing that means a throat, it could have been a thrust, it could have been a cut, but clearly it's obvious why someone would die from that, especially in an age where there were no paramedics and there was no quick medical care that could be given, uh, and possibly the only other person there was his assailant anyway. So in this case, we've looked at chest, we've looked at head, and now we've looked at throat. Now, just while we're going through these rather morbid um, uh, death accounts from the 16th century, I thought I'd throw in one here which was accidental death, and this doesn't tell us anything really about um, combat in general or strategy or anything like that. Uh, but essentially it was a, a coroner's inquisition into a death. What had happened, uh, the two were playing, it says the two played together pretending sportively to make an affray to fight one another. So they were messing around. Uh, John Fells having in his right hand a staff worth halfpenny, uh, halfpenny and George Ogden having in his right hand a sword uh, still in the scabbard as he had no thought to do his playmate any harm and that whilst they were so playing John Fells ran in upon George Ogden and received in his left eye the point of the sword which was still in its scabbard and so by mischance received a wound of which he died um, sometime later. And this was recorded as death by mischance as they called it, so misadventure, accident. Um, so you know this could, you could relate this to a combat account where an otherwise non-thrustworthy object, you know, something like the tip of a staff or something, could enter someone's brain and therefore, uh, you know, eye and brain, and could kill them. It might not be an instant death, but clearly this poor guy ran onto the end of the scabbarded sword and um, it, it killed him. So even whether it was real combat or pretend combat, these sorts of non-deliberate deaths can of course occur, even in a fatal combat. So I could go on and on and on with accounts like this, but there are literally scores and scores of accounts which describe a death during a sword or other weapon fight, which is either a blow or stab to the head, or a what's probably usually a stab to the upper chest. 
But there are two other targets which turn up with some degree of frequency, and there's one target which never, like, or almost never, I, I know one, but almost never turns up in the accounts. So let's just cover these and I'll give you some examples. So one body part which turns up occasionally as a source of a fatal wounding is the belly. And the other one is the thigh. Now, uh, hopefully all of you know that you've got big old arteries in your thighs and that a uh, cut in the thigh can be fatal in a very short amount of time or a thrust, um, but severing the artery. Um, a huge amount of blood loss very, very quickly. So thigh wounds can be very, very dangerous. Um, bellies, obviously, being shot in the belly, shrapnel in the belly, very, very nasty. But what is interesting to me is we don't see belly wounds, although they are here as a cause of fatality in the sword fights in the 16th uh, and 17th centuries, they're not common at all. They're not nowhere near as common as people describing the upper chest um, or head. Now, why is that? I think there might be some medical reasons. Uh, it could be simply that you're less likely to die in the immediate term from a wound in the belly from a sword anyway. Obviously if there was shrapnel or you know, bullets or stuff that might be a different type of uh, physiological effect on the person. But a blade, it seems that belly wounds weren't a cause of fatality. Or is this, so could it, could it be survivor bias and the fact that people didn't necessarily die of it? Or could it be that people weren't being stabbed in the belly so often? Now, anecdotally, anecdotally, sorry, we uh, we train HEMA, we fence on a regular basis with these weapons, okay? Now it's my observation that usually, because your uh, weapons attached is in your hand and is attached to your shoulder and you're fencing up here and aiming at the chest and face most of the time, actually belly stabs don't happen very often or belly cuts don't happen very often. One of the reasons is when you lower your arm down to that sort of height, you're leaving your chest and head exposed, but moreover, it's further away. Now, if we consider, obviously I'm sitting down here, so it'd be difficult to demonstrate, but if, if we consider some of the stances of this area, era used for rapier fencing, they often lean the upper part of the body forward and have the belly back. Um, so, if that's the case, and if your belly's back, it's further away from the opponent, it's less likely to get hit, and possibly if it does get hit, it's less likely to be fatal. So I think there's a few things at play here. Let's look at some examples. So Middlesex session roll, 1584. Um, I'll jump forward. It says a certain Walter Chamberlain, late of the London Yeoman, was together in the, uh, um, in the highway called the Broad Sanctuary at Westminster, so central London, when after an interchange of hostile words, they then and there drew forth their swords and daggers so this might be rapier and dagger, sword and dagger, impossible to tell, and in the same common street made an affray, in which affray Walter Chamberlain with his sword gave the said Robert uh, Bishop in the left side of his belly a mortal blow of which he died. Um, it doesn't say how long after he died, but so was this a thrust, was this a cut, we don't know. If I had to put money on it, I'd say this is a thrust in the belly. But this, this is an example, and you do come across others, or of a wound in the belly which results in death. However, as mentioned, these are far less common in the historical record that I've seen so far than upper chest wounds and head wounds. Here's another example from uh, the session rolls of 1561, and it says, again I'll jump forward, uh, William Murfitt slew the same Edmund by giving him in the belly with a sword a mortal blow of which he died on the same day. Uh, was it a cut? Was it a thrust? We'll never know unless we find another account which uh, gives a little bit more detail, but these fatal belly hits are recorded, they're just not very, very common. So we've talked about how the primary, most common injuries that we find in these reports are to the head and to the chest, um, how, and occasionally to the belly. However, necks are mentioned occasionally, as you might expect, neck being a great target. And also remember the clothing involved here, because often the neck might be exposed in a way that the torso, or with a hat, the head might not be. So when we're talking about fatalities, the neck being exposed is the same in modern crime. If you get a cut or a thrust in the neck, it can often prove fatal and there's no clothing in the way to protect it. Here we've got a quick one. This is from uh, 1582, again, Middlesex session rolls. I'll jump into the middle of it. Um, 
Uh, da, 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 da. advanced with the intention of wounding the same Jenkins and Robert, and that Jenkins Hughes, having in his right hand a sword and in his left hand a buckler, and Robert uh, Barraclough, having in his right hand a sword and his left hand a dagger, again, very common for this period, were fighting and making a fray with Oliver Dorrington. Uh, when there came the aforesaid Thomas Williams into the same highway, who having has a big old melee here, um, having a rapier in his right hand and a buckler in his left. A big variety, and it's interesting there, the contrast between rapier and sword, and in English literature at this time, it does suggest there's a, a difference in those blades, and we assume that the rapier is a more thrust-centric and maybe longer uh, blade. Joined in the fray, fighting on the side of Oliver Dorrington against Jenkins Hughes and Robert Barraclough, in which a fray Jenkin Hugh Jenkins Hughes, with his sword, gave Thomas Williams on the right part of his neck there, uh, a mortal blow, which would suggest a cut rather than a thrust, of which he instantly died. Uh, you know, I mean, a cut in the neck often will kill a person, I guess, from a cutting sword. Um, so uh, there we go. And, and so it's Thomas Williams. So it was Thomas Williams was the guy with the rapier. So in this case, it was a person with a sword hitting the person with the rapier. So the sword, win for the sword over the rapier there. Um, so probably a cut in the neck. So as I say, we do see references to neck wounds, not infrequently. So far, I would say head and chest are the most common, and then belly and neck are in the second tier. Now we're gonna move on to perhaps the third most common, or possibly it might even be in the second tier of most common category of wounds. And this might surprise some people, and it might even annoy some people in HEMA circles uh, who hate leg cuts. Uh, so leg cuts, leg attacks are actually a little bit controversial in some circles. For a start, if we look at modern Olympic sabre fencing, the legs are off target. Now, actually, if we look at the first Olympics, uh, if I remember correctly, the first or second Olympics where sabre fencing was included, legs were a target. But subsequently, um, after a few years, they just decided to um, basically put call everything below the waistline, the belt line, off target. So modern Olympic sabre decided to remove uh, leg attacks. However, as you all know, in a real fight, legs are a valid target. And in HEMA, legs are, in most places and in most systems, a valid target. Now, there are some treatises and manuals, and there are some modern HEMA practitioners who argue that attacks at the legs are, are too risky and they're foolish or they shouldn't be counted with the same points. Well, this, my friends, I think flies in the face of those naysayers. I am a massive fan of leg attacks, and I think that sabre fencing, I think that modern Olympic sabre fencing should also include uh, legs as a target, as Epe does, incidentally. Um, and the fact is that it massively changes how you regard the fight when you're fencing in sabre if you include leg attacks. Obviously in HEMA we always do, at least I, I personally, I think there's some, there's some groups that don't uh, use leg attacks all the time. And historically some continental European systems didn't use leg attacks, but we do anyway. And in Britain it was conventional to uh, include leg attacks and therefore to learn to protect against them. And one of the big criticisms of Massiello's 1895 infantry sword exercise was that he doesn't include any leg attacks and he doesn't include any defences against leg attacks. And whatever you think about the wisdom of giving leg, leg attacks, surely it's a good idea to prepare to protect against them because your opponent might have different opinions to you and might attack your legs. But these sources will show that leg attacks absolutely can be mortal, fatal. And why shouldn't they be? Because your thighs at least are full of really big arteries which can make you bleed out very very quickly. So here's the first example from 1562 Middlesex session rolls uh, in Fulham County Middlesex on the same day about 6 p.m. John White late of Hammersmith near to where well, in fact I was born in Hammersmith uh, County Middlesex yeoman assaulted William Thomason and murdered the same William by giving him with a forest bill and that's a type of bill like the weapons that we often talk about on this channel on his left leg, a mortal blow. So uh, a forest bill, I uh, guarantee you, could give, I mean, it could remove someone's leg if you, if you really went for it. Uh, but, you know, a chop into the leg, presumably severed veins and arteries, 
blood everywhere, dead a very short time later. Here's a later one from 1592, Middlesex session rolls again. Sans widow, when thither came uh, Richard Cockett, who forthwith said to the same George Ashley these English words, George, I have occasion to go to the fields, and I pray you walk with me thither. Whereupon Richard Cockett, armed with a long sword, in this era that could just mean a long one-handed sword, or it might mean a two-handed sword, we don't know, and George Ashley, armed with a rapier, walked together till they came to a close called the Maze, in the parish of St Martin aforesaid, where after speaking words to one another, they drew forth their weapons and made an affray. So clearly the conversation hadn't gone well. In which affray, George Ashley, with his sword, gave Richard Cockett, who had a rapier, on the outer part of his leg, a mortal wound of which he died within quarter of an hour. So you can assume blood loss, I would say there. Um, it's interesting that he says on the outer part of his left leg. Now, the fact that it's his left leg, which usually will be your rearmost leg, uh, is interesting. And the fact that they say on the outer part. The fact that it's on the outer part means it's unlikely to be arterial. Um, but so a big old cut through the meat presumably lots of bleeding which couldn't be staunched and probably, I would say, after a quarter of an hour, probably means died of uh, blood loss. Um, so there, another great example of a cut with the sword into the leg that proved fatal. This one, same source from 1550. Uh, the said Robert Hackett was at Westminster in Gods and the King's Peace in a place called Thev Theving Lane uh, when he was assaulted. Um, Gladius et cult cultilis by John Little, late of Westminster, barber, who, with a certain sword called a wood knife. Um, now, I, I'm, again, that requires further research. Probably means like a hunting hanger or something like that. Uh, some sort of, sort of short sword, I would assume. Gave the said Robert Hackett on his left leg above the knee a mortal wound, of which he then and there died instantly. <laughs> um, so uh, difficult to say exactly what, you can only assume blood loss, I would guess. It depends how deep the wound would be. Anyway, blood loss almost certainly, I would say. Um, and this uh, was perhaps more work, murder rather than a duel, but nevertheless, good illustration of the fact, cut to the leg can prove pretty quickly fatal. This is one from 1573. I'll just jump into the bit that's pertinent. Uh, Hugh Yennens returns to John Lowbury at Mount Millfield when the latter drew his sword and the fight was renewed. And in that ensuing affray, Hugh Yemens with his pike, he's fighting with a pike against sword, gave John Lowbury in his left thigh a wound. So it's a stab wound because it's a pike, of which he died within two hours. Some pretty long uh, drawn out death. Um, and so, and blah, blah, blah. So that's interesting because we know it's a thrust because it's a pike he's using, stab wound into the um, left thigh, presumably nicked an artery, or maybe not, because two hours is quite a long, that's a, far longer than an artery. So I don't know, some kind of blood loss, two hours is pretty slow to die from something. But nevertheless, that might, well, it did finish the fight. We always debate about, you know, a wound that is gonna only kill you at some time later, in this case, two hours later, does that finish a fight? Well, this suggests, yes, if you get stabbed in the leg, even if you're, you've, I mean, in modern medicine, you, if, the, if you weren't gonna die for two hours, modern medicine could save your life, I would say. But nevertheless, it put the person out of the fight. So in this case, yes, the leg wound was fatal, Yes, the leg wound probably could have been non-fatal in a modern medical uh, environment, but it did, almost certainly from this context, finish the fight anyway. Another one here from 1593. Um, Thomas Fleet retreated from the same William Atkins, and so far as uh, he was able, he fled towards a certain field called Wheelfield near Whitechapel, when William Atkins followed him and renewed his attack upon him with the intention of murdering him, upon which Thomas Fleet drew his sword. Again, this is in legal terms, this is showing self-defense. And in the affray thus forced upon the said Thomas um, with his sword, gave the said William on his right leg over the knee of which, it doesn't say gave a wound, it just says gave over his right knee, of which he then and there died instantly. But nevertheless, thrust or cut above the right knee, as quite specific, so the kind of bottom of the thigh above the kneecap, presumably, 
uh, and he then then and there died instantly. Now, that's quite difficult to reconcile with what wound just above the knee would result in instant death. I don't think that that can be medically correct. It's possible that he entirely severed the leg, in which case there could have been enough blood loss that he would have I don't know, gone unconscious and then died, medically died, uh, a minute later of blood loss. Difficult to say, but nevertheless, according to the source here, a good example again of what some modern HEMA people might regard as a superficial cut, resulting in fight ending number one, death number two. Here's yet another one from 1554. Uh, John Grove, armed with a sword and buckler, assaulted him with the intention of wounding him and that after retreating from his assailant even to a ditch in the same highway near St John's Wall, so again it's showing legally that this was self-defence, and doing his utmost to escape from the affray, again legal disclaimer, uh, so forced upon him, Henry Snelling, fighting in lawful self-defence with a sword, gave John Grove on his right leg above the knee a more blow. Again, the right leg, that for a right-handed person, that's the leg that's usually leading. I see tons of cuts in sparring land around this area, around the knee or just above the knee on the thigh. Um, above the knee, a mortal blow of which he there and there died, and then and there died instantly. Again, in modern sparring, this is often a hit that gets discounted as not being as good as a thrust in the chest or a hit on the head. But it killed him. It ended the fight and killed the opponent. So, you know, these hits on the front of people's legs can absolutely be killing blows. Now, this is an interesting one from 1584. Again, middle succession rolls. Uh, I'll jump into the middle of it. Um, after parleying with one another in a common street called Long Ditch of the said city made, the said city being uh, London, uh, made an affray with one another, each of them fighting with sword and dagger, in which affray William Glazier, with his sword, gave John Style on his left foreleg a mortal wound of which he died on the last day of the said month. Now that's interesting. So he had pr a protracted period of suffering before he died. Um, therefore, and it says foreleg. Now, foreleg means lower leg. Now, as you've noticed, most of these leg attacks are to the thigh or just above the knee. And my observation is inspiring that it, that is the most common target. Often, even when I aim at the lower leg with a riposte, for example, I often hit around the knee or above the knee anyway because of the nature of someone usually backing off as they're retreating or recovering from their own attack, which you've just parried. Um, so the fact that it says foreleg is Interesting and rare, okay, statistically according to the sources we've looked at here, it's the lower leg, but additionally the fact that it makes sense that he didn't die instantly from an attack on the lower leg, because he wouldn't. Even if you had the lower leg chopped off, so long as you could staunch the bleeding pretty quickly, you'd probably survive, certainly in the modern world you would, but even then uh, it could be cauterized. So the fact that he died sometime later is interesting, presumably, I don't know, blood loss or blood infection, who knows, it doesn't give those details. But, important point to note, while he didn't die instantly, it does seem to have been a fight stopper, okay? And this is something we often forget in modern martial arts, doesn't matter whether it's HEMA or Kendo or whatever else. A hit that might seem superficial might be enough to stop the fight. A hit doesn't need to be a fatal blow to stop the fight and win the fight, and indeed, Often what is the fatal blow might be preceded by one of these fight stopping, stopping blows. So imagine you're fighting someone and you hit them in the lower leg. They fall down on the floor and go out of action. You could then kill them by stabbing them through the chest. And what would be recorded would be a thrust in the chest. But what really finished the fight and finished them being a worthy opponent or a dangerous opponent was the cut in the leg. So we've dealt with heads and necks. We've dealt with chests and bellies. We've dealt with legs mostly thighs and a little bit of lower leg. Um, this is the final target, which many of you will be wondering why it hasn't been mentioned so far, and that is the arm. I found one example. Now, I have seen others before that I couldn't dig up uh, in time for this video this time. They do occur, but they are rare. We'll talk about why in a second, but I'll just um, give the uh, example here. Uh, jump into the middle of it, um, accompanied him to St. Clemens Fields in the same parish where John Williams and Francis Turner fought together and that in the affray so fought John Williams slew and murdered Francis Turner by giving him with a sword a mortal blow on his left arm 
of which he died within half an hour. Now, you have got arteries, you've got major veins in your arms. I would say that that means blood loss. So he chopped him in the left arm and it was deep enough or it hit the right location that due to blood loss, he only survived for half an hour. Um, this is interesting. The overall question here is, why are arm cuts featured so rarely in these sources? So I've got a couple of possible answers for you here. Number one, part of it could be to do with the nature of clothing in this period. If you look at um, 16th and 17th century men's clothing, very often the arms are actually quite well covered by layers of fabric and puffing. Okay, so number one, it might be relatively hard in an unarmored environment to get wounds on arms. Okay, that's the first thing. It might be that, you know, narrow bladed side swords uh, and uh, rapiers, for example, don't cut well enough. Just grab a rapier because there's one right here. It might be that they don't cut well enough to put remarkable wounds on people's arms most of the time. That could be one answer. The other answer is the source bias. Okay, we've got to recognize that these are recording fatalities. Now you're more likely to, to die medically from head wounds, neck wounds, upper chest wounds, sometimes belly wounds, sometimes thigh wounds, because of blood loss, because of organ damage. Okay, a, a wound in the arm, now someone might be in an affray and might lose fingers, lose a hand, maybe lose an entire arm, and so long as the blood loss can be staunched, you're going to survive and therefore those people will never make it into these sources. For all we know, it could be that arm and hand injuries were the absolute most common. And I have to say a lot of people that practice swordsmanship would guess that that's probably the case. Um, but we don't know for certain because we don't have the statistical data to support that. We can only surmise. So I think it's very, very interesting. I think that a lot of people out there might be surprised by some of these things. I think some people might, won't be surprised by the fact that head and upper chest uh, uh, thorax injuries are what, record, what result in death most often. I think some people will be surprised by how many examples there are of death caused by leg injuries, okay? It seems that leg injuries were way more uh, common cause of death than a belly injury were. Um, was. Um, and I think a lot of people will be surprised by how rarely arm injuries are featured in these accounts, although I think that's probably for the simple reason uh, that arm injuries are less likely to be fatal. Okay. Uh, however, they could have been fight enders. Um, so again, as I said before, it could be that the wound in the arm which doesn't get recorded was then having hit the person in the arm with your sword, you in that moment their arm is disabled and you then run them through the body with your sword and the coroner only records the running through the body with the sword it doesn't record the injury that happened to their hand or arm that's possible and I think clothing shouldn't be discounted as well because to thrust a rapier through someone's chest regardless of their clothing is pretty easy to hit someone in the head or neck with a sword cut that this is not covered by clothing arms are more likely to be covered by layers of fabric which make cuts not thrust so much, but make cuts certainly more difficult uh, to wound through. I hope this has been uh, valuable to some of you and interesting. I know that these videos tend to be long-winded and that's because I have to read these sources, but I also have to give a number of sources to show a degree of statistical analysis. I would also finish by saying that all of these are from the Middlesex session roll, so it's just one source, but it's a very rich source to mine. Um, and there's, you know, the source bias, um, and I've mentioned all of those things. So take a bit with a bit of pinch of salt, but I still think that the data presented here is useful and interesting and can open up avenues of further research. Please give me a thumbs up. It means a lot to me. And I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon again. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.